and thank you for joining us today. My name is Becky Sanders. I am the Program Director for the Upper Midwest Telehealth Resource Center and also Director of Operations at the Indiana Rural Health Association. Today we're going to be hearing from Robert and Stephanie, uh, what they, the program that they've done at Union Hospital for pre-hospital telestroke care. Robert is the Assistant Chief of EMS Education and Operations in Terre Haute with the Fire Department. And Stephanie is the Executive Director of the Rural Health Innovation Collaborative. I guess go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Becky. So today's presentation is about a pre-hospital telestroke program and our collaboration with the Terre Haute City Fire Department to help improve the quality of stroke care our community receives. So just to give you a little bit of background about Union Hospital, Union Hospital is a 383-bed facility located in West Central Indiana. We also have a critical access hospital located 15 miles to the north, and then we have 24 primary care physician um, service sites um, throughout the Wabash Valley. We are a non-for-profit um, healthcare system that's committed to providing advanced quality health care for our community. Um, since our beginnings in 1892, we've continued to expand and improve our services and our facilities. Um, so we are very um, lucky to have such innovative technologies available to help improve our outcomes and quality of care. In 2013, Union Hospital was awarded the Platinum Governor's Award for Excellence, um, and that was for Ohio, Indiana, and West Virginia for performance excellence through the Baldridge Criteria. Um, we are also an accredited primary stroke center, an accredited chest pain center with PCI. We see about 60,000 emergency department uh, visits annually here in Terre Haute and about 12,000 at our critical access hospital site up in Clinton. Also, to let you know, we have um, what's known as the Wabash Valley Rural Telehealth Network. Um, the Wabash Valley Rural Telehealth Network is comprised of nearly 25 sites through West Central Indiana and East Central Illinois. They have been conducting live video telehealth consults since 2007, getting their beginnings uh, with behavioral health consults due to the shortage of uh, behavioral health professionals. Um, formally named in 2010, and we also received some State Office of Rural Health grant funding to seed our early projects, and most recently received two first grant awards, one in 2010 and one in 2014. The evidence-based tele-emergency services network grant program is our main focus with our live telemedicine programs currently, where we're focused on three main categories of teletrauma, telebehavioral health, and teleneuroservices. We see about 5,000 live video consultations on an annual basis. To learn more about the Wabash Valley Rural Telehealth Network, please visit our website at www.ruraltelemet.org. And now I'm going to let Robert tell you more about the Terre Haute Fire Department. Okay. <clears throat> the Terre Haute Fire Department is a full-service fire department uh, specializing in fire suppression, prevention, uh, rescue, hazardous materials, and advanced medical service for the city of Terre Haute and the citizens. Um, it's a municipal-based fire department. It uh, houses uh, eight fire stations. Three of them house uh, paramedic ambulances. Um, and we make approximately about 9,300 runs annually, and that comes out to about 8,000 of those, which end up being medical, of which we transport about 6,700 of those. Okay, okay uh, so where is Terre Haute located? Uh, Terre Haute is located about 75 miles to the west of Indianapolis. Um, it's about 100 miles to the, uh, north of Evansville um, as well. Um, we're located right on the state line uh, to the west of, with uh, Illinois. Um, let's see. Major interstate. Uh, uh, we have um, multiple uh, state highways, um, U.S. Highway 41, U.S. Highway 40, um, Interstate 70 all uh, passing through here. There's a lot of uh, rail traffic that comes through here. Um, so that's just where we're located. Yeah. 
So that way you can just kind of put us on a map and, and know where we're at. So just for um, some orientation purposes, um, I just want to go over the basics of what is classified as what we call an ischemic stroke, also known as a brain attack. Um, the one thing to know about stroke is it can happen to anyone at any time. This kind of stroke happens when there's blood that the blood flow is obstructed to an area of the brain. And when that happens, oxygen cannot get through and those cells begin to die. Um, those areas where that blood flow cannot get to and those oxygen cells cannot get to, those areas start to, to die and that impacts whatever area of the brain that functions, the memory, muscle control, those kinds of things. So it's always important to know um, where that clot occurred and what type of impact that patient would have, but that is most readily detectable on a CAT scan. That's how we diagnose that. Um, and again, just as bullet point two is how a person is affected by their stroke depends on where the stroke occurs in the brain and how much of the brain is damaged. So the longer that clot obstructs the blood flow to that area of the brain, the more damage there will be. Okay, so for example, someone who had a small stroke, if you had a family member or a community member or neighbor um, or relative that had a small stroke, they may have minor problems. They could have had temporary weakness of the leg or they just may not have full functionality of one of their limbs. Um, some folks have speech difficulties or maybe they have understand, you know, trouble understanding um, what is said. The people who have larger strokes can be permanently paralyzed on one side of their body. They can lose ability to speak and they never recover from stroke. And two-thirds of stroke survivors end up with some type of disability. So just to kind of paint a picture of how prevalent stroke is, it impacts 800,000 people um, each year. Um, they experience a newer recurrent stroke. It happens every 40 seconds and is the fifth leading cause of death in the United States. Up to 80% of the strokes um, that occur can be prevented, and we'll talk about that a little later in the presentation. And um, again, um, talking about those larger strokes and two-thirds of patients becoming disabled, it is the leading cause of disability in the U.S. Other types of strokes, just to educate you a little bit, there are hemorrhagic strokes, which hemorrhagic means bleeding. Um, and if you look at the picture there to your right, you can see that there's blood that leaks into the brain tissue. That's not the type of stroke that we're talking about today. We're talking about the ischemic stroke or the brain attack, where the clot stops the blood supply to the area of the brain. There's also a transient ischemic attack, or what's known as a TIA. Um, some of you might have heard these types of events be labeled as mini strokes. And these types of events have reversible symptoms within 24 hours and there's no identifiable clot noted on the CAT scan. Well, Vigo County, um, we're not proud of this statistic, but we rank 39th out of Indiana's 92 counties for stroke mortality. Our rate is 53.63 for 100,000, um, which is well above Indiana, which is sitting at 40. 0.69, and then well above the United States rate of 36.17. I would say that we attribute that to our population health. Um, we have a lot of problems with cigarette smoking in the Wabash Valley, um, uncontrolled high blood pressure, sedentary lifestyles, and unhealthy um, eating habits. We also have a high prevalence of drug use that is also in the area, which leads to younger people having strokes. So it's so important, and I'm going to take this opportunity just to remind the audience about the symptoms of stroke um, and how to spot a stroke, and you only have to remember the acronym FAST. So weakness, numbness in the face, arm, leg, or one side of the body 
but the most pale, pale sign is if that face is drooping. Is the smile unequal? Um, arm weakness, speech difficulty, and if that's the case, it's so important to call 911, and we'll talk about the importance of 911. But patients can have loss of vision or dimming in one or both eyes, loss of speech, difficulty talking, or understanding what others are saying. It could be a sudden, severe headache with no known cause, loss of balance, unstable walking, but it's usually combined with another symptom. But from the, the Stroke um, Association, um, we really want you just to take away the acronym FAST, face, arm, speech, and time, um, to be able to intervene if stroke happens. So just to orient you to the project background, um, stroke care involving an ischemic stroke or the stroke type that we just discussed earlier where a blood clot disrupts blood flow to a certain part of the brain and deprives it of oxygen is very time sensitive. If patients um, activate, recognize and activate the signs and symptoms of for the signs and symptoms of stroke early on, then they may be eligible for a medication called TTA or Activate. And it is very key to know that this medication should be given within three hours of the time of onset of symptoms, with certain guidelines being published up to four and a half hours for certain eligible patients. So it is so important to understand and recognize the symptoms of stroke, to call 911, and to come to the emergency department. And that's probably one of the, the, the largest issues that I see is that people just don't get to the emergency department in time. And so any step in the process to expedite that care and treatment offers the best chances of survival and the reduction of disability for patients who are suffering from the brain attack or the ischemic stroke where a clot is the culprit of the disruption of blood supply to a certain area of the brain. So just to give you a little bit of background about TPA, TPA works by dissolving the clot, which then in turn improves blood flow to the part of the brain being deprived of that, that oxygen. And again, if it's administered within three hours, and again, up to four and a half hours in certain eligible patients, TPA can improve the chances of recovering from stroke, thereby reducing disability. A significant number, and I cannot overemphasize this, that stroke victims do not get into the hospital in time for TPA treatment why we have to recognize the signs and symptoms of stroke very early on to get them to the hospital, call 911, and activate the chain of survival. So next, Robert is going to tell you more about our specific project and how we're working together between the hospital and the fire department to be able to expedite that chain of survival and reduce the time-sensitive measures for patients. Okay, so the process uh, that we currently have in place uh, right now, um, as patients call 911 and we go on uh, these emergency runs and we get to the patient's house and we establish uh, an assessment of the patient, try to determine how long it has been since the patient was acting appropriate and did not have any kind of symptoms, um, we go through and uh, utilize a uh, stroke scale that's pretty similar to that FAST um, that we had talked about earlier. We ask the patient to smile, um, looking for facial droop. Uh, we look for arm weakness, um, see if one side is weaker than the other. Um, and if there is any, and we ask them to uh, talk to us and if there's any kind of slurred speech or any issues with their speech, um, we automatically uh, classify that patient as potentially having a stroke. And we uh, then uh, radio that to the emergency department by uh, letting them know that we have a patient who is having a stroke alert. Um, 
at that time, uh, we'll get the patient loaded into the uh, back of the ambulance. Um, we'll make a uh, video connection uh, to the emergency department via um, a uh, program or an app called eBridge, um, utilizing an iPad on the medic truck. Um, while we do this, uh, it's video and uh, video and voice capable. Um, so that the registrar and whether the emergency room physician is available at that time um, can actually talk to us, talk to the patient at that time. Um, they can see the patient, see what kind of symptoms that they're presenting. Um, the registrar can get the information from the patient um, that they need to uh, immediately process the registration for that patient. Um, the doctor can then uh, do his little assessment and confirm, you know, what we're seeing is you know, potentially a stroke, um, then they can, the emergency department then can contact the CT uh, department um, that there's a patient on the way who's presenting with stroke-like symptoms, and if the patient ends up being stable upon arrival, uh, we'll end up bypassing the emergency department altogether and go directly to the uh, CAT scan. And again, this is all part of the process of trying to, you know, we're dealing with that three hour or four and a half hour window that we were talking about earlier. It's all in an effort to try to uh, limit the amount of time um, that is used to have the patient be registered and try to do as many things as we can all at once so we can really speed up that uh, process and speed up that time. Um, so I'll talk about the technology that we're using. Um, eBridge is a, a software solution or basically an app um, that operates on the same uh, radio communication system um, that is utilized by our EMS and the emergency department. Um, it's the same uh, technology that we use to uh, call them up on the radio to let them know that we are coming in with any patient, um, with any other kind of patient that we would normally bring. Um, it works on a real-time audio-video uh, connection, audio-video com communication. It's uh, very similar to Apple's uh, FaceTime, um, or if anybody uses like Skype or uh, like GoToMeeting or anything like that, it's basically the uh, same basic concept. Um, the HIPAA and patient privacy um, is uh, not a factor here. Uh, is it's all the uh, data transmission is completely encrypted. Um, so like, you know, there's no risk of uh, anybody being able to hack into it. It's all completely encrypted. Um, all the data transmission is done uh, via a standard 4G LTE cellular network. Um, we use uh, the Verizon mobile hotspots in our trucks, um, and that's what we use to contact the hospital and stream this uh, communication with them. Um, and then on the truck itself, um, we all have iPads on the truck um, that have the eBridge application um, that we use to contact the hospital. Um, some of the barriers, opportunities, and challenges that we have for this project. Um, one of the uh, biggest ones, obviously still, uh, even to this day, is just the population of recognizing quickly enough that they are having stroke or are displaying stroke-like symptoms. Um, getting patients to contact and call 911 um, as soon as they start having symptoms instead of waiting or you know saying, oh, well, it's just a headache, it'll go away, I'll feel better here in an hour or two, um, is still one of the biggest uh, one of the biggest barriers that we have. Um, it's just primarily patient education and just public education with that. Um, some of the other uh, barriers that we have um, and challenges is connect connectivity um, and bandwidth, um, primarily using a voice video streaming app. Um, we need to make sure that the network is working at all times and all that. Um, it's just the same with uh, using the cell phone. And then, you know, sometimes towers go out, sometimes calls get dropped. Um, those are uh, some of the barriers that we have uh, to that. Um, it's also a new process, um, and Stephanie, you might be able to uh, speak a little bit more about this. Um, they had a, uh, um, whenever you had your stroke accreditation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so recently this year we underwent our um, HFAP accreditation process for Primary Stroke Center. And our survey was from the Carolinas, and 
she was actually uh, from a primary stroke center there where she was a practicing clinician. And when she learned about our, uh, our process and our implementation of this plan, she was very engaged and very excited to know that we were going, you know, against the grain to look at how we could bypass the emergency room to get to that CAT scan to do the gold standard identification of that ischemic stroke and get that TPA on board, TPA onboarded um, in the most expeditious way possible. And really looking outside the, the box of how do we implement and streamline best practice with the resources tools um, and that we have on the ground now. And so it's very hopeful that this pilot will be able to yield new data and we will be able to share our experiences and our practices as we forge towards our go live, which is in a month. We had hoped and were very ambitious that we were going to be able to get it up sooner than that, but as Robert um, alluded to, we had some firewall uh, configuration pieces that we are still continuing to navigate, um, quality of video streaming uh, in terms of installation, digitization, um, and so we're doing some troubleshooting. And so I think that that is a huge message for the audience in terms of, of starting um, new programs that are outside the box in that you have to have patience and perseverance um, because sometimes not everything um, is within your control and you have to really rely on a very interprofessional and collaborative team um, to be able to overcome the challenges and solve problems um, when it comes to negotiating firewalls and respect for space and transmission and, you know, and looking at is there any level of impedance with the trucks and do we need to help increase that. And so it's really been a plan, do, check, act, process improvement initiative. Um, but it is one that both the hospital and the fire department are very committed to because it does and will improve the health, well-being, and outcomes for our community that we sit. Um, so from the hospital side, I'll talk about the next bullet point, and then I'll turn it over to Robert to talk about the fire department side. So um, the emergency department here is always, um, I don't want to say they're conditioned, but they are used to having a lot of change thrown at them in a very quick fashion. Um, they already won um, several telemedicine, live video telemedicine programs in their clinical environment. We already have teleneurology and we also have telebehavioral health. Um, that department, just with their live telemedicine program, completes close to 1,800 to 2,000 live video consults a year. So they're very, um, they're very, um, technologically um, integrated. They've been on an electronic health record um, in the ER since 1999. Um, you know, they are a great group that multitask and they function very well um, in high demand. But when you inject change, there's always the skepticism. There's always the leadership gloves that you have to put on and say, this is what we're doing, this is the process, you have to make sure that people understand it, that you have good communication skills, what is the expectation, how does the information come in, how are we going to measure success? Um, because again, anytime, whether it's an it's a innovative or a technological injection or if it's a clinical process, you have to follow the same steps and the standards to educate your core. Um, to make sure that your project has support. But in addition to the emergency room staff, we also have to work with radiology staff because this is a new process for them in that the patient is going to be pre-registered, they're going to be banded upon entry, and then they're going to be rolling into CAT scan. So we have to work with CAT scan teams to make sure what if when the ambulance calls in their report, there is a person in CAT scan 3 or CAT scan 2. And how do we shift in re our resources and mitigate 
you know, patient satisfaction um, issues on the other end if we're having to prioritize emergency uh, inbound patients suffering from stroke. And so it's really um, helped us to identify core process improvements around the whole stroke initiative that this program for us, um, we've had a lot of champions on the ground that, that will make this a success. So on the fire department side. Um, on the fire department side, uh, we also have a lot of the uh, same issues. Uh, again, it's changed. It's a little bit different than what we're used to. Um, so I imagine that um, there will uh, be some hesitation uh, to utilize this. Um, however, that being said, um, there are a lot of guys on the ambulance now um, that have come up in the system. Um, a lot of younger medics that have come up in the system to where patients bypassing the emergency department to get to uh, like the CAT scan or going directly to the cath lab, um, that's not something that's unheard of anymore like it used to be, you know, even back when I was in uh, medic class about 10 years ago. Um, it's to the point now to where guys are coming to me asking me, well, how come we're not doing this already? We should already be doing this. We should already be bypassing the emergency department for these kinds of things. Um, so I believe that there's there's still a lot of support for it. Um, it's just going to be the added extra step of having to dial up on the iPad and, and contact the hospital um, to do that. But for the most part, for, for the some of the things that we've added here uh, recently and, and have added some small uh, changes to other parts of our job. Um, they've actually taken to it quite well. So I, I really feel like they will have um, a, a good amount of buy-in um, and support on this. And I'd also like to mention that similarly with our chest pain center accreditation, we worked collaboratively with the fire department to implement a pre-hospital EKG transmission process. And so, you know, while that's a storm forward type system, um, this is just a live video piece for stroke. And so we have no doubt that um, the project and success will be achieved. But I think that the biggest opportunity, I mean, we can put all the technology to the problem. We can put all kinds of resources around it. But going back to the community level, going back to population health management, going back to um, lifestyles, behaviors, knowledge, and attitudes towards health is probably one of the most important and key um, initiatives that needs to be um, identified as really trying to prevent stroke. Um, so working with um, partners within the community, whether that be um, with the Chamber of Commerce and looking at Better Health Wabash Valley or St. Mary's of the Woods and Pomeroy Pride, or any of the other um, local efforts that look at improving community health and wellness, we have to continue that fight and we have to continue to educate our community about the signs and symptoms of stroke and prevention of stroke. Uh, so the next step from here, um, uh, the current plan is uh, the project will go live um, this coming August 2015. Um, hopefully by that point we'll have all of our uh, little bugs that we're still working on trying to get taken care of um, eliminated at that point. Um, from that point uh, there'll be uh, data collection um, that'll need to be done um, primarily and, and a lot of that will be uh, based on you know did we use the product the way we were supposed to, um, what was the end result or the outcome of that patient? Um, did us bypassing the emergency department for that initial 20 to 25 minutes of getting the patient registered, the initial assessment, all that kind of stuff while we're waiting for the CAT scan, um, did all of that make a difference in the patient's um, end outcome? Um, that'll be all part of our uh, uh, data that we end up collecting. Um, and then uh, end up reporting that and uh, disseminate the findings uh, from that data collection as well. Yeah, so I think that Robert hit on a very good point there in that, you know, the key measure that we'll be looking at is, is for those eligible patients, that door to what we call needle time or the administration of that TCA or activate. 
because again, the more time we can shave off the clock to get within that three to four foot five hour window means that that person might not come out of the hospital with a disability. So we are going to follow, you know, those stroke accreditation um, guidelines in terms of our core process measures. Um, but we're very excited to be collaborating with one of our um, community partners to help improve stroke outcomes in us. So um, since this is a recorded session, there is unfortunately not an opportunity to um, ask questions in a live format, but both Robert and my email addresses as well as our phone numbers are located here on this contact information uh, slide. And please feel free to contact either Robert or I um, if you have any questions or would like to learn more about this exciting project. Thank you very much.